shooting fans, stay tuned for an American Shooter exclusive as we're the first to take our cameras inside the Federal Ammunition Plant to show you how they make rim fire, center fire, and shot shells. Plus, the Scandinavian rifle design that armed the Rough Riders, the Craig Jorgensen and great guns, and Byron Ferguson is both throwing and shooting for the shot of the week. It's all today, here on American Shooter. American Shooter is brought to you by Colt and the new Colt XS series. If it isn't a Colt, it's just a copy. And by Outers, gun cleaning kits, chemicals, traps, and shooting accessories. Welcome to this edition of American Shooter. I'm Jim Scouten, and most of the time on this show, we're talking about guns. It could be a story involving the Springfield M1A, the current version of the M14. And if we're doing that, I'd typically tell you it's chambered in 308. But I wouldn't tell you where the ammo came from. Well, today, we're making up for that, tracking this Federal 308 back to the source in Anoka, Minnesota. There will be a smile and a welcome at the first of two security checkpoints, but only if you have business here. There are no tours of the federal plant northwest of Minneapolis, and a new face would be noticed in a workforce that's remarkably stable. Uh, we've been on site here for 77 years, and our employees average about 15 years of service. And that's uh, an immense asset to a manufacturing organization. Inside, under 800,000 square feet of roof, a thousand employees tend a forest of green machines, specialized presses, since ammo making is mostly metal forming. First, the brass. These are going to be 308 cases after five operations, two trips through the draw press, stretching the brass cup to cartridge length, then heading, stamping the primer pocket and head stamp in one quick stroke. Next, it's a quick lathe cut to form the extractor rim. Between operations, the cases are heated. It's called annealing to relieve the stress in the brass. And another conveyor ride to the next operation. The last, in this case, the turret press that necks each cartridge, then trims it and plugs it to size the opening. Now, a final wash in the tubs that look like cement mixers, and we've got shiny new brass. But we need bullets, and most start here with ingots of lead going into the furnace to come out as a three-inch cylinder, solid but still hot. And with 200 tons of pressure from the hydraulic ram, the lead cylinder literally sprays out as lead wire, extruding six strands for this order of nine millimeter bullet cores, wound into coils to supply the cutting machine. That is the next step in the process, feeding wire into the machines that cut and form the core. Then it's a quicker than the eye series of steps as the jacket receives a core, is seated, flipped over, formed, sized, and rolled to press the cantilever or knurl around the center. And we've got bullets ready for loading. But we don't have primers. Federal needs millions of these each year, so they're made a thousand at a time in trays with the cups loaded by vibration and the anvils, the inner structure, also filling their own plates. The cups ride outside the main building into a blockhouse where Sean Fitzsimmons is doing the charging, standing in water on an anti-static mat. He rubs the ball of primer material into a plate of holes that precisely measures the material before flipping it over to be pressed into the cups. While it stays wet, the primer compound is relatively inert, but not entirely, so static electricity is a danger here. Back inside, the plate of cups mates up with a plate of anvils before being unloaded and inspected and sent to build a cartridge. Priming is done separately here and rapidly as the cases are punched for the flash hole before the primer is pressed in. Then it's a tiny bead of clear sealer visible under ultraviolet light. And then the sharp eyes of Joel Vogel, who can see imperfections our camera can. not That's a neck fold right up here, right on top of the mouth. Little small neck fold. Those gotta come out. 
With Joel checking, only the good ones get through to supply the high-speed loader. This is a fully automatic operation with bins feeding primered cases through seven turrets. Ken Hartfield is running this line, stopping only to load powder into the brass hopper and drop tube. Turret one flares and trues the mouth of each case. The powder drops through glass funnels in the ride around turret two. Next is the powder check, then bullet insertion at turret four before seating in the ride around five, then the crimp in six, and a final profile check before lining up to move past Ken for final inspection. I pick out flaws like this, or if there is something that comes through that uh, wouldn't make it fit in the gun right, or perform right, it's picked out. But the rest move past into the automatic packer that lines up 10 at a time to fill the familiar red plastic carriers. Stacked together, they move into a box, untouched by human hands. But the testing isn't over. Before the shift ends, Crystal Van Hout will fire test rounds for pressure and velocity to be sure there are no variations in powder. Galen Brown will test for accuracy, printing under an inch and a half on his scope at 200 yards. And Jerry Schwab will run a function test, in this case in a Remington 700. He'll do the same for pistol cartridges, as he has millions of times in his 35 years here, looking for trouble before it ships to you and me. They worked in the firearm, the cases are all right, and everything seemed to be normal. No surprise there, Jerry, with the quality control checks that monitor every round produced by some of the most experienced employees in the business. And we've got more from Federal coming up, how they make shot shells and millions of 22s. There is one part of this plant we cannot show you. Behind these doors, Federal manufactures the most accurate 22 ammo in the world. $80 a brick, $8 a box. But this is the ammo that captures gold. How they make it is a secret. But we do know the dimpled head is part of the accurizing process that helped Lonnie Miley win Olympic gold after Federal decided American shooters should be using American-made ammo. So this may sound like uh, quite a bit of patriotism and flag-waving, and if that's what it is, then we plead guilty. We can show you regular 22 ammo production, which is much like center fire. First with the case stamping in the draw press, five steps in one pass of the brass coil. Then there's heading to shape the rim. Priming is done like center fire in trays, but directly in the cases. Next, powder measured on a grid and released to the tray all at once. And then the plated bullets all line up for seating as a group. Then there's crimping, lubing, and packing. 500 to a box, millions a year for America's most popular round. Or should we make some shot shells? In that case, polyethylene pellets are mixed with color beads, then heated and extruded in what first looks like thick wall garden hose until it's stretched. This is called the heat exchanger. And it's, it's the temperature of the glycol, which is around the tube while it's being stretched, is about 271 degrees Fahrenheit. And this allows us to stretch it without busting it, cracking it. And after the cutter, the hulls move out by conveyor tube to get the base wad that's wound and inserted in one quick stroke before moving to the header machine. This is a multi-operation turret press with hulls indexing through to get a brass cup and a primer and then being crimped and formed in another stroke. Then it's the loader that looks much like the center fire operation but has turrets to load more elements with the triple plus wad column going in over the powder and then the shot cup marching in to be inserted on top of that. Then comes shot dropping in precisely measured quantities, then the crimp and rolling past the inker to pick up a label. And they're ready for packing with Mary Lenz on final inspection as the shells move by heading for the boxes that each get weighed to kick out any that might have missing shot. It's fully automated manufacturing with machines doing the work while Federal's experienced employees check the process. All along that process, we're checking for the right powder weight, the right shot weight, the adjusters are doing checks, ballistics are doing checks, and then of course we have our visual inspection at our packer area. 
And after all that, you've got no excuses. If you miss the target, it's not because your federal ammo didn't perform. The short history of America's first magazine-fed service rifle. And then it's a new shotgun with an old history in gun tech. Colt, AR-15. So common now we hardly think about the advantages of a magazine-fed rifle. But back at the turn of the century, switching our army to a magazine-fed battle rifle was a major change, one that caused no little difficulty in choosing the design that could handle smokeless powder in a repeating action. Great guns. Brought to you by Ruger, arms makers for responsible sportsmen. In the late 1880s, the United States was still using 15-year-old technology with the single-shot 4570 trapdoor. But some European countries had progressed to shooting a flatter trajectory, higher velocity cartridge at longer ranges. Smokeless powder and magazine-fed rifles put the Europeans ahead of America in firepower. The U.S. had to play catch-up, so the Army began testing for a new rifle. And the competition was open worldwide. Well, there was a lot of furor over accepting a foreign design in this country. Over 50 models were tested, from the Belgian Mauser to the Australian Manlicker to America's own Lee, Savage, and Springfield. But the 3040 Krag met what everybody was looking for. It's a Norwegian design that uh, was, had uh, gotten a lot of success in Denmark. Uh, we picked it up from the Danes. Colonel Ole Craig of Norway first designed the bolt-action repeater in 1868 and perfected its design 20 years later with the help of fellow countryman and gunsmith Eric Jorgensen. The Craig Jorgensen was adopted as the U.S. magazine rifle model 1892, and production started two years later. As with previous military rifles, it was produced in carbine form as well. The 3040 Craig was our first bolt action and also the one that first standardized a smokeless cartridge, both of which were advantages. The bolt set a benchmark for smoothness, but it came at the expense of strength due to the single locking lug. The 3040 designation referred to the old method of naming a cartridge, 30 caliber bullet with 40 grains of powder. Five of these rounds are dropped into the side loading box magazine but the Krag could be used as a single shot with the five rounds held in reserve. The generals back in Washington felt the clip-fed Mauser was too wasteful and didn't promote accurate fire. The men on the front lines didn't agree. If you have two or three rounds, you could load it back to five. And the stripper clip with five rounds in it was not considered an advantage at the time. We learned it was. <laughs> By 1901, the generals conceded they needed a rifle that could handle a more powerful cartridge. And that led to the magazine-fed 03 Springfield. The short history of the Craig Jorgensen came to an end. So basically, we're talking 11 years. This actually was the shortest length of time any of our standard arms were used. But the Craig was effective enough to prompt a few lines in a song that was popular with the volunteers fighting in the Philippines at the time. Underneath the starry flag, civilize them with a crag. American Shooter presents Gun Tech, the latest in guns and shooting gear. As a new shotgun in town that comes from a long tradition of Italian gun making, this is from Fab Arm, a company that's been making high quality shotguns since 1900 longer than some of the better known Italian names. This is the Gold Lion autoloader in blued steel and beautifully finished wood. This is the Camo Lion in Advantage Camo. The Fab Arm gas system is self-adjusted with a recoil reduction system built in and fewer moving parts than other autoloaders. And the price is attractive at about $960 suggested retail. All right, now that we got it dirty, time for a wipe with the Tico tool, a new quick clean gadget from outers. Between rounds of clays or right after shooting, run the Tico tool down the bore and you'll clean out most of the dirt and grime that could start rust or affect your accuracy. Tico tool is 15 bucks, that's cheap insurance. 
Now here's something you should know about. Hanging on these special edition Ruger Vaqueros, this tag here that says this gun is covered by Davidson's lifetime replacement guarantee. Now Davidson's is one of the biggest distributors of guns and every one they sell to gun shops is covered forever. So if this Ruger breaks, you take it back to the gun shop and they will give you a new one. But only if the gun shop bought the Ruger from Davidson's. You got the idea. This is a nice piece of insurance if you see one of these tags. Davidson's is also big enough to package special editions like the Vaqueros here. This one with a spare cylinder. This done in simulated ivory grips and scroll engraving. Nice. That's gun tech. And coming up, Byron's doing all the work himself, both throwing and shooting at aerial targets. American Shooter is brought to you by Smith & Wesson, the world's largest manufacturer of handguns for sporting, law enforcement, and military use since 1852. And by Federal Ammunition, Federal Knockdown Power. Over the years, we've had Byron Ferguson with us. He shot a lot of things out of the air. You've seen that. But those were targets somebody else threw for him. Today, Byron's all by himself doing both jobs. You know, hitting the target is not always the hardest part. Sometimes it's just finding somebody to throw for you. Not a problem, just learn how to throw for yourself. If someone else is throwing for you, all you have to be concerned with is the bow. But now you've got to throw the target, get the target in the air, get the fingers on the bow string, get the bow drawn, take aim, release. A little too easy. Those wood discs are roughly the size of birds of uh, bobwhite quail, pheasants at the outside. So obviously anytime the target is small it's a problem. When the target is moving it's a problem. When the target is not only moving but it's accelerating as it moves is a big problem. I know you can't get anybody to throw for you on this next one. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's pretty good shooting, don't you think? <laughs> all right, all right. We'll do it for real one time. Think I'm cheating, don't you? <laughs> Not this time. Now I can hear the sound, I know where the target is, and I have to just mentally visualize how much lead I got to have. Ah! <laughs> All right. Well, you just seen probably what's the hardest archery shot in the world to make. I wouldn't advise you to try that one in your backyard, especially when the neighbor's watching. <laughs> Byron, if my neighbor were watching me try that shot, there wouldn't be anything to see. Now, here's the lineup for next week. It's cowboy time again in Norco, California, as some 17,000 people show up to enjoy the Old West experience at End of Trail. Plus, the story of the lever-action Winchesters from the Henry to the Model 94 in Great Guns. And Bob Munden's taking aim at nail heads and aspirin. For American Shooter, I'm Jim Scouton. I'll see you then. In the meantime, shoot safely and keep them in the 10 ring.